with that, um, I'm going to run a little video here that's going to help set up um, our first guest, uh, Rachel Moore, the president and CEO of the Music Center in Los Angeles, um, a pretty remarkable institution. And this video is going to, if I can figure out how to do it, this video is going to provide a little bit of background uh, in terms of what the Music Center is and the scale of their work. So let's start with this video. Rachel, join us. Welcome. Hello. That's a lot. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, busy. <laughs> we um we love in this program to you know really start just kind of being centered pre-pandemic, right? Because ultimately we have to spend a lot of time, and we will spend some time today talking about how we're navigating the pandemic and, and getting restarted. But you know, ultimately this is about work we've all have done for a long time before, and and are excited to carry on to the future and. Um, I'm reminded seeing that that clip of last week's program, just the similar clip around the Tree Fort Music Fest in Boise and just how ready I think we all are to get right back at it and uh, just feeling like we're we're right on the cusp. So 
So how are you, and let's just start kind of big picture. How are you in House of Center and, and I, sort of what are the mechanics of where you are in your process about getting ready to reopen and, and start to build schedules and, and all that good stuff? So like most, uh, last March 13th, we shut down everything and the theaters, the indoor theaters remain closed. Um, we had to lay off or furlough around 1,100 employees, which was incredibly hard. Um, we uh, have been working with the state of California and the LA County about reopening guidelines. And it took a long time for them to even lay out the options of it because LA County was hit so hard by COVID. Um, there's a four color tier system and purple being the worst. And we were in purple for a long time. Um, we are clawing our way out. Um, the uh, guidelines have been released. We look at it as more a um, turning up the volume as opposed to an on and off switch. So we will, starting in May, uh, have um, outdoor performances socially distanced, which we're super excited about. Um, we uh, produce a big dance series, and so we're bringing in four different dance companies. Um, each will have a week residency where they'll do um, five performances and people will be in pods and uh, get to see the performers perform. And it will be incredible to actually have artists working um, with an audience and being sort of being able to get together. Uh, and then we will continue to sort of open things further. I'm going to expect that the fall will be the first time we have the theaters indoors actually open. Um, in this past year, um, we've been, actually using a lot of the spaces indoor for film shoots. So that's been sort of our, our attempt at <laughs> having a little earned income. Um, uh, but like most, we have pivoted to a digital platforms. I think that it's been uh, really good for us and for a lot of people in the performing arts. We hadn't taken digital as seriously as we needed to, or it wasn't a priority, or there was always something else. And this pandemic really was a kick in the tuchus that we needed to um, strengthen our digital chops. And as we emerge, we will have hybrid experiences where we live stream and whatever. I don't think we're ever going back to just um, proscenium-based work or live work. I think that uh, digital is here to stay and it's really exciting. And my hope is that people don't see it simply as a bridge to get through COVID, but rather as a way to enrich uh, the artistic experience. Um, Cause I think that's what our patrons want. And I think that's where the future lies, um, but it's not easy to do well. And so we need to be mindful uh, around it. But um, I actually am really excited at the prospects of being able to have a broader reach and possibly explore things like uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, immersive work. I, I think that it's, we're entering this incredibly different world um, and you can either you know, shy away from it, but I think we should as artists embrace it and run with it. Um, because that's what's going to ensure our relevancy going into further in the 21st century. Now, you used a kind of a really interesting word, uh, the word patron. And I would love to explore, again, maybe talk a tiny bit about your charter and your mission and sort of the organization itself. Why does it exist and how is it structured? And then let's connect that into who you think you're intended to serve and need to serve and, and what does it look like in mm -hmm. practice? Mm -hmm. So the Music Center was built um, at the same time Lincoln Center and Kennedy Center in the early 60s when the arts were really about these white temples to classical art and people drove in, parked, saw the art and left. And the people were white, wealthy folk <laughs> watching white art. <laughs> um, and the world has changed and um, we have changed. Um, the Music Center is structured in that we have uh, resident companies. So the LA Philharmonic rents Disney Hall from us. Center Theater Group, our theater company, rents the Mark Take Perform and the Amundsen Theater from us. And the um, LA Opera um, rents 
uh, the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion, and then the Ellie Master Chorale is also in Disney Hall. And then, um, you know, we also, the Music Center per se, Inc., um, brings in dance. So we are the dance folks. So we bring in, you know, the American Ballet Theaters or the Alvin Ailey's. And, and because of our theaters are so big, the Chandler is about 3,400 seats, we are the pretty much the only game in town that can bring these giant companies. And if it weren't for us bringing these giant companies, they just really wouldn't hit LA, um, which would be a tragedy. So we feel that, you know, that, that piece of dance is very important to us, um, that sort of centered, rooted in a much more traditional uh, art form, but um, incredibly important. I showed up about five years ago and was given the mandate by the board around relevance. And so we really wanted to look at ourselves about what is our value proposition to the broader community. And so we changed our vision to become deepening the cultural life of every resident of LA County. And that language was very um, specific in that it was outward facing. It wasn't, you know, uh, about us. It was about the people we serve. We are, um, the buildings and the land are owned by the county. We are a county asset. We take our public mandate incredibly seriously. I feel that we have a moral obligation to serve every taxpayer in LA County. Um, and LA County is huge. It's the size of Connecticut um, with 10 million people. We are arguably one of the most diverse counties in the country. Um, so we really need to be mindful that our work um, engages with all sorts of groups. And I think that we've also, um, when I came in, we restructured our artistic offerings. And instead of saying, oh, we have dance over here, engagement stuff here, education, I brought in um, a woman, Josephine Ramirez, to uh, be our head of what we call the Music Center Arts, our arts division. And her job is to ensure that we use engagement as our curatorial lens so that everything we do has to be thought of how does this deepen the cultural life of every resident? Not that every program does that, but we need to be mindful that we are um, um, reaching out and working with all sorts of different kinds of artists and arts groups. And, and, and further, we've talked a lot about how the the performing privileged sort of proscenium art, you know, the we are going to do this art for you is one bucket of art you can do. There's another bucket, which is we have artists and we're going to create art with people. And then um, we are, there's a third bucket where we have folks creating art for themselves, mm -hmm. you know, so and the traditional structure is that the four is very privileged and these other sort of buckets, we think all three are important because how somebody engages is incredibly important and, and it can happen in myriad ways. Um, and we have put together um, partner networks with artists because we, this is not about us conferring anything upon the community. This is our jointly co-creating, co-curating work with the community and with artists from Los Angeles County and elsewhere. Um, it is, we take a much more humble stance about who we are and what we can do. Um, we are facilitators and um, supporters um, because art, the capability of creating art is within all of us. And I think that until until we get away from that, the artist lives on a pedestal and we should, they, they're untouchable. They're not, they're gonna be easily dismissed because they're living in a little isolated bubble of uh, privilege. And that is not what art should be about in my opinion. It's, it's um, needs to speak to the heart and the soul of everyone and, and how we connect with people that way. Um, I think there's huge opportunities and I'm really excited, you know, that we're sort of going into this new world where we um, 
uh, are, in, are interacting and engaging with people in lots of different ways in the arts. It's not just coming into a theater or sitting quietly and watching something on stage. And a big part of, of where you were headed or, or where you're just sort of in the early days of doing is the activation around the plaza before the mm -hmm. show and, and really thinking about your physical plant and, and what that, you know, sort of the implications of that space. Could you speak a little to the plaza and kind of your vision for that as, as we get back to opening up? Yeah, so um, the plaza, which is a beautiful space, originally, you know, when we were in the 60s, it was the place that rich people walked through to get to a theater. So we embarked on a $40 million renovation and we um, flattened it out and we put in big, um, uh, we're up on a sort of a hill that we put big escalators and made a front door. So it's very clear that it's super welcoming. And we have a giant fountain in the middle that can be um, shut down, giant plasma screens, a new sound system, so that we have um, uh, ambient art um, on the screens and music going very uh, uh, frequently, uh, certainly pre-COVID. And then we um, uh, added a bunch of restaurants, um, restaurants with different price points, because once again, um, somebody who is of limited means can't have a $15 burger. So, you know, we have tur tur uh, tacos and burgers, but we also have a wine bar and um, uh, a restaurant where we have a, we call it the Emerging Chef Program. So every quarter we identify local uh, chefs and bring them in um, and they get to take over the restaurant so that they get to uh, increase their chops in what it means to have 200 plates an hour um, and get introduced to a whole new uh, um, community. And then we've partnered with the county to do job training to um, reach out to the uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, that population to give them training to get jobs in the restaurant industry. So there is a piece of that. And, and going back to, we feel that we are not just a cultural institution, but we have an equal identity as a civic institution and as an anchor institution. And we need to give back to our community on that civic front. So for instance, for um, the uh, most recent presidential elections, uh, we were a, a voting center um, in California. Um, you don't have to go to a specific place. You can go to any voting center. And so we opened it up in COVID even and had all these people come. We've been doing blood drives. We're looking into becoming a COVID vaccine dissemination spot. So having a real civic piece to it and the, the, we want the plaza to be a place where people can just come and hang. It's a piazza. It's a place to, and that's, that's really needed in LA because mm -hmm. there's not a lot of places just to sort of hang. But similarly, the park, which is a 12 acres right across the street from us, you know, we have lots of places for people to hang and, uh, you know, there's yoga and all sorts of stuff happening. And we have been dedicated to raising a bunch of money to provide free and low cost programming so that there's lots of stuff to activate the plaza and you can enjoy the music center and the, uh, the plaza, the park. I mean, you don't have to be super wealthy <laughs> to do it. Um, that it's not just the art that might appeal to you, but you can actually, you and your family can come and enjoy it. And you saw on the video, we have this great thing called um, DTLA Dance, which is free um, every Friday during the summer, uh, non-COVID. And we have a, a dance teacher come and pe teach, you know, whether it's a, a merengue or whatever, and um, Bollywood. Uh, and then we either have a live band or music, depending on what it is. And we'll get 5,000 people all dancing together. And what's so fun is, that starts around seven. People start showing up at the plaza about five mm -hmm. and they camp out with their dinners and they bring picnics and it, it is a family affair and people are all up dancing together. And it is incredibly diverse and incredibly welcoming. Um, and it's um, just a, an incredible amount of fun. And what the best thing is when we have one of those big, you know, 
convenings of people dancing and all the theaters are going. And mm-hmm. so the theaters get out and you have this huge sort of ma- mash of people from all sorts of different walks of life coming together and activating the space. And that is super fun. Uh, I can't wait to get back. <laughs> well, and I think, I mean, let's, let's broaden out the conversation a little bit because, you know, we've had a lot of, of, of conversation very appropriately for the past year on the role of like independent music venues and sort of not, you know, sort of a, a you know, a real um, much greater awareness about what, you know, the importance of kind of grassroots venues and neighborhood venues and, and sort of the ladder of venues and all that talk. And, and there's been a less discussion, I feel like about, you know, kind of the larger institutional performing arts centers, you know, other than concern that they're like gobbling up all the money and, you know, Kennedy Center got a bazillion dollars and, and things like that, you know, and, and Kennedy Center and in in some of the early relief act. And I, I think that a little bit of what maybe has been missed in that conversation is a lot of what you're talking about, the sort of re-envisioning of what these centers are and what the role is and how does that play out in terms of their community engagement and, and what it really means to offer programming and, and be a welcoming space. And could you speak a little bit to kind of the more of the national conversation that you're part of and helping drive about not only what you do in LA, but there are echoes certainly of that in, in terms of what the Kennedy Center has been doing over the last decade in terms of their kind of, you know, rethinking their mission here in DC and, and others. Is this something, I mean, you're seeing as sort of a national conversation? Absolutely. Um, the performing arts centers across the country, I mean, the reality is the communities in which they exist have made huge investments in these large institutions. And it would be foolish to say the least to turn our backs on the large, these large investments. Um, it's more important that we drag them into the 21st century. And, you know, some communities it's harder to do than others, obviously, um, because we've got uh, a very divided nation. But uh, increasingly the conversations are around how do we reimagine these buildings in ways that do provide value to the public? Uh, Because regardless of where you are, we all um, are held in the public trust. We're 501c3s, we get you know federal tax deduction um, and we raise money and we have an obligation to our public and uh, the public around the country. I mean, LA may be very diverse, but we are simply where LA, New York will be 15, 20 years from now. And so uh, the world's changing and we need to remain relevant and we, really do not want to throw away these incredibly important buildings. And in an ideal world, it would be strengthening the partnerships between these institutions and the local arts organizations that exist. It's an important piece of the ecosystem and it is an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And we talk a lot about how, you know, what is our role in trying to support that ecosystem? hiring artists. I mean, we were so excited that through this course of this year, we've employed 600 artists on various projects uh, because making sure people have jobs is, arts jobs is really important. <laughs> um, and so I think that, that that there's been a huge shift. And I have got to say, <clears throat> the um, setting aside the saga around SOS and SVOG and, and how it may be rolling out um, being implemented, which is problematic to say the least. Mm -hmm. Um, What was heartening for me is that this bipartisan bill invested $16.25 billion into the performing arts, the largest infusion of resource from the federal government into the performing arts sector in the history of this country. And the the bipartisan element of it should not be uh, looked over that whether it's Nashville and Mitch McConnell or Austin with Cornyn or Rubio, because Florida has the most performing arts centers in the country, um, as well as, of course, you know, I would expect Schumer, I would expect, you know, Klobuchar to be huge supporters of the arts, but to have these other folks who understand that these venues, whether they're commercial or nonprofit, are the lifeblood of a lot of communities. And they're going to be critical as we reopen to re, um, basically revivify downtowns and communities. And, and also that these organizations are gonna be critical in 
how we heal, you know, being able to come back together. I mean, the arts are so good at connecting people and generating empathy and joy and allowing us to work through our grief. You know, mental health has been taken a battering this past year and the arts are gonna be incredibly important for us as we try to get out of this catastrophic moment in our country. And just in, in, in closing, um... I love your thoughts, and I imagine you have some thoughts on this, but, you know, so so we do have this historic investment, and, and you're right, and we've talked about this. I mean, $16.25 billion, more money than the NEA and the NEH have had over 50 years combined. I mean, just a complete recalibration of, of money. But again, we don't want to, you know, long-term always be thinking about relief. We want to be thinking about reimagining and sort of, you know, forward motion and what this could and should look like moving forward. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts about what you'd like to see from the administration as they come together to sort of what you would like to see in terms of Congress or the administration in terms of thinking about the arts ecosystem and, and what are those intersections and what would you like to see, you know, in an ideal world? Yeah, well, I certainly hope that the arts get a piece of the infrastructure discussion that is coming because I think that we are an incredibly important part of that. <clears throat> One of the things that I really think is high time for given this investment and given our role. I mean, just as an example, you know, the creative economies in California represent 8.2% of California's gross domestic, domestic product. That is huge. And innovation and creativity are one of the great um, differentiators of the United States from many other countries. You know, it is, it is our secret weapon and we need to support that. I really think there needs to be um, at a minimum, a senior person on the executive branch that can advocate for arts and culture, can help coordinate um, policies uh, alongside, you know, the NEA and the NEH and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and IMLS. Um, and, and really have conversations around copyright um, and immigration because we are so dependent upon visas and the uh, cross-fertilization of artists from different places and uh, tax policy, you know, how do those deductions work? I mean, and how do they, what are the implications for the arts as well as straight granting programs? And then you look at, um, uh, you know, the Department of Education and HHS and HUD and how nobody is at the table advocating for how their policies in these various departments are, impact the arts. And we need to have a voice. We need to be at the table. So if we can get somebody who is um, super smart and persuasive <laughs> um, to be advocating for our value. I think it would be incredibly important and it's about time. Yeah. <laughs> well, Rachel, I think that's spot on. And, um, and it's just so great to have you join us today and, and share a little bit about what's going on at Music Center and where you're going and, and kind of the broader, broader context. And that's a, a great transition point now to bring in Damon and, and Rebecca, because um, a lot of what Rachel was saying from a different kind of wearing a different hat, I think, you know, dovetails with a lot of what you guys have been talking about for, for a bunch of years. Um, so, Rachel, thank you. I know you can stick around as long as you can. I know you're going to have to jet in a second. Um, 